desiring motherhood despite severe disability. In our contemporary healthcare environment, nowadays, people with severe disabilities or extensive disabilities can survive while maintaining total dependence on others for the basic activities of daily living and with dependence on mechanical ventilation well into reproductive years and beyond. Despite those severe disabilities, people who live independent, dependent lives long for relationships family life and parenthood as much as their peers without disabilities. Here are pictures from art of motherhood and desire to be a mother. I would want to state another article from the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities 2006. Article 23, state parties shall take effective and appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against persons with disabilities in all matters relating to marriage, family, parenthood, and relationships on the equal basis with others so as to ensure the rights of persons with disabilities to decide freely and responsibility on the number and spacing of their children and to have access to age-appropriate information Formation, reproductive and family planning education are recognized and, by, and the means necessary to enable them to exercise these rights are provided. States shall ensure the rights and responsibilities of persons with disabilities with regard to both guardianship, wardship, and adoption. In all cases, the best interest of the child shall be paramount. State shall render appropriate assistance to persons with disabilities in the performance of their child rearing responsibilities. In no case shall a child be separated from parents on the basis of either disability, of a disability of either of a child or one or both of the parents. Now what's this case? This is case is about a ventilator-dependent woman of childbearing age with muscular dystrophy who requires full assistance for all her daily needs, including bathing, feeding, toileting, dressing 24-7. She's able, however, she's able to communicate intelligently and is able to steer an electrical wheelchair with one finger and to use electronic communication devices. She also may maintains a very active social life. The woman approached the healthcare team with a request for advice and assistance in obtaining fertility treatments in order to fulfill her dream of becoming a mother, either with pregnancy or with a surrogate mother. The question was brought to a multidisciplinary ethics committee of the institution where she received care. The committee was comprised of physicians, including a fertility expert, a rabbi, a social worker, and psychologists, nurses, and a lawyer. The following issues were discussed. What are the health risks of fertility treatment and resulting pregnancy for a woman in her condition? dependent on mechanical ventilation, I want to stress. What are the short and long-term risks for the child resulting from a high-risk pregnancy and a potential premature birth? How will build the physical and emotional parental capacity affect child and mother's well-being? What are the ethical and moral obligations of the healthcare team regarding to the well-being of the woman requesting assistance and balancing the risk involved, the well-being of the child yet unborn, the society who will carry the burden of cost and caring for mother and child? The rise, uh, I would now want to cite uh, Sagit Moore. The rise in disability critical activism has demonstrated the seemingly self-evident assumptions about disability have always been a silent yet salient feature of bioethics theory and practice in questions relating to life and death, sickness and health, provision of healthcare services, allocation of resources and more. 
Bioethics has historically endorsed an individual medical approach to disability that values and prioritizes medical professional knowledge, but de-evaluates and marginalizes disabilities people, knowledge, and experiences. Even progressive accounts of bioethics tend to adopt an individual medical approach to disability that views lives with disability as a life of lesser value and a burden on family and society. Quillette points out to the importance of bioethics, of listening to the voices of people with disabilities, unearthing prejudice and pursuing inclusive justice. And ethical decisions have the potential to be influenced by the biases that may be present, resulting from a subjective experiences and cultural backgrounds of those in decision-making roles, such as the healthcare team. Now, what about parenthood and disabilities? I'm quoting Ora Priletensky, which is one of the experts in about motherhood, and uh, she wrote also a big book about motherhood in mothers with disability. Parents with disabilities and parents who are unable to independently fulfill all the physical tasks of raising childhood are often subjected to skepticism. Those who subscribe to disability rights perspective have long argued that independence is not about ability to carry out tasks of daily living without assistance. Rather, it is the ability to lead an autonomous life and make decisions about important life choices. Here is a, a famous sculpture of an artist, Alison Lapper, who was born without her limbs when she was pregnant in eight or nine months of pregnancy. This uh, replica of the sculpture was in the Paralympic Games in 2012. Now, what's about importance of motherhood in, in Israel? Israeli society child-centered. Having children and raising a family is highly valued in Israel. Israel is characterized by high marriage rate and high birth rates. In Israel, the use of state-funded assisted reproductive technology is the highest in the world, eight times higher than international average. Now, what are the risk of pregnancy in women with myotonic dystrophy? And this is a series of women who were less disabled without need of mechanical ventilation. We know there is a high rate of complications such as miscarriage, preterm labor, preeclampsia, peripartum hemorrhage, and also a risk of maternal disease progression during pregnancy. Now, what about fertility options and disability? A similar case went to court in Israel in 2015. Ora Mor Yosef, a physically disabled woman with muscular dystrophy, wanted to be a mother, but was cautioned against pregnancy because of her health risks. After a lengthy endeavor, a niece agreed to be a surrogate mother. Mor Yosef's niece underwent a procedure, note, with an unrelated egg and sperm donor in India and gave birth in Israel. Immediately after the birth, child welfare officials declared the newborn to be in danger and placed her in foster care. Israeli courts, including the Supreme Court, refused to recognize Yosef as a child's mother because they are not biologically connected. The decision was criticized by disability advocates who claimed that the courts did not consider the special circumstances of her disability or inability to achieve motherhood in other ways. Ways. Now, a, a, what are fertility options, disability, and the best interest of the child? I'm saying about the committee of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine 2013. Offspring welfare is a valid consideration that fertility programs may take into account in accepting patients and providing services as long as they do not discriminate on the basis of disability or other impermissible factors. However, it does not follow that they are morally obligated to withhold such services except when significant harm to future children is likely. Now, the European Committee, in addition, the same committee said, their decisions should be based on empirical evidence, not stereotype or prejudice. They should not assume that the presence of serious disability automatically disqualifies someone from being a capable parent. Here we see examples from the internet. Now, uh, the Task Force on Ethics of the European Society of Reproductive Medicine 
uh, claims that there are three different standards or different standards to evaluate possible adverse consequence consequences to the future child. The maximal welfare standard, no medical assistance in reproduction when there are indications that the future life condition of the child would not be optimal. And the other extreme, the minimal threshold, medical assistance re in reproduction is only unacceptable if the future quality of life expectations is so low, low, so low that the child would be better off not being born, like wrongful birth. And the intermediate standard is a reasonable welfare. Reproduction assistance is access, access, acceptable if the future child will have the abilities and opportunities that make life valuable in general. The Mori Yosef Public Committee of Fertility in Children in Israel, 2012, the committee adopted only the reasonable welfare standard as a guideline to balance between the rights of two parenthood and the good and rights of the future child. The committee recommends that at least one of the parents should be functioning independently or mostly independently. Now, what are the voice of the family members, the mothers? the best interests of the child. Disabled mothers themselves claim that their disability has some benefits and brings something unique to their role as parents. They are able to give children emotional support and teach them to be more independent. Here is a, a, a qualitative study that they interviewed the experiences of disabled women facing the challenges of pregnancy, childbirth, and motherhood. They see that the mothers claim celebration and achievement, and the other hand, they have fear of perceived threat to mother and future baby. Now, what about disability, motherhood, and social justice? Human flourishing is defined as an effort to achieve self-actualization and fulfillment within the context of a larger community of individuals, each with the rights to pursue his or own, okay, own such efforts. As a society which we committed to promote, encourage, and support individual human flourishing. When it comes to just distribution of societal resources, the achievement of equity in health requires social organization in the form of redistribution of resources and related legislation and regulation. This regulation requires an ethical commitment on the part of anyone, those most fortunate and those in need, with the goal of providing health capability to all. For more yourself and the case presented, social justice has to be found in the context of the relevant society and its members. No matter whose health needs or personal goals are sought of, there are costs that need to be covered. There are costs to the child, caretaker, society, and to disabled women requesting motherhood. The social justice can only be achieved when people with disabilities seeking to achieve their life goals and attains their health capabilities of assured a process free of bias, best of mutual, res mutual respect and within the context of societal values and available resources, and must also consider the associated cost and the needs of justice for other members of society. And I would conclude with the song of Rachel. I'll start with the English translation. If only I had a son, a little boy, with dark curly hair and bright, that, that, that I might hold his hand and stroll gently, gently, gently on the path of garden, a little boy. בן לו היה לי ילד קטן, שחור טלטלים ונבון, לאחוז בידו ולפסוע לאט, לאט לאט בשבילי הגן ילד קטן. תודה רבה.